Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us as we continue CareCMB's adaptive series with this accessible travel webinar. I'm Avery Roberts, and I work in community outreach and engagement for CareCMD. I'm here alongside Kelly Berger and the rest of the CareCMD outreach team. This webinar will be focused on taking a deeper dive into how to travel, where to travel, and most importantly, why travel as a person with a disability. We'll introduce some fun adaptive excursions to partake in that you may have not thought were possible living with a physical disability. You'll also have the chance to learn some creative transportation opportunities to fulfill your travel goals. All right, we have a fairly large lineup this go around. Um, so now our speakers, Michelle Irwin, the founder and president of All Wheels Up. Sophie Chiato and Rob Gunther from the Adaptive Sports Center, Patrick Laduca, the program coordinator from Impossible Dream, Caleb Reed and Brock Johnson at Adaptive Sport Surf Project, Ian McKay, executive director of Ian's Ride, Alvaro Silberstein, co founder and CEO of Wheel of the World. Kevin Chandler, author, speaker, and founder of We Carry Kevin, and then the Nelson family who are neuromuscular disease community members. We so appreciate you guys being here with us today. So at this point, I'm going to pass it over to Michelle to touch on accessible air travel along with the advocacy side of things as well. Thank you so much for that terrific um, introduction. So All Wheels Up is a nonprofit and we focus on accessible air travel by funding the research necessary to make that happen. Uh, we are still the only nonprofit in the world to have crash tested wheelchairs and the securement systems um, to FAA uh, seat standards. And so by doing this work, our goal is to provide a wheelchair spot on airplanes, just as you see on buses and, and trains today. Um, All Wheels Up uh, was established over 10 years ago. Um, and what originally was very painful in getting the industry to think about a wheelchair spot on airplanes has now um, progressively moved in at very quick pace to what we're starting to see in research and development by other um, OEMs um, on product for a wheelchair spot on airplanes. Um, to quickly take you through our history, um, in 2016, we did crash test the very first uh, wheelchairs and tie down systems, and we took that to Congress um, as a proof of concept study to prove that uh, a wheelchair spot was technically feasible for commercial air travel. Um, and then in 2018, the FAA Reauthorization Act was signed with a larger feasibility study, um, which subsequently um, in 2021 after publication agreed with All Wheels Up that a wheelchair spot was technically feasible. Um, since then, we've been able to host working groups with every major stakeholder. So everybody from um, the advocacy side, so other um, advocacy groups, um, as well as OEMs, regulators. Um, and when I say that, I'm talking about the airframers such as Boeing, Airbus, um, OEMs, which are the seating manufacturers, such as like a Collins Aerospace and others, um, and including FAA, IATA, and other international regulators um, via, via Canada. And so we're really proud of the fact that the industry, while many and most will be quiet about their participation and the work that they're doing, um, you know, we'd never, we want to make sure that we're having positive and responsible messaging. Um, but a key factor is that responsible messaging and it's uh, not to uh, mislead the community that there may be something um, very soon for a wheelchair spot on airplanes. And so, um, Hopefully that is reassuring to the community that a lot of work is being invested in what the future of accessible air travel will look like. Um, in 2022, All Wheels Up um, did get awarded National Accessible Air Travel Day. Um, and it is a day that um, even other um, advocacy groups as well as Congress and the White House um, are as of 2023 going to start um, to recognize and celebrate. Um, and it is to continue to raise awareness that while um, we recognize that there's a lot of 
great work that has been done in the aviation um, field, um, more work needs to be done. And so um, I'm not going to bore you with all the stats, we know them, but you know, there's over 4 million wheelchair users and currently there's more than 29 wheelchairs being damaged a day. And that's why we're here. We're here to make sure that um, people who use wheelchairs can travel safely. And so we do receive funding and some of that funding is put towards uh, research. So in addition to funding that technical research and, and crash tests, and we even have other crash tests happening later this year, we also fund that proof of, con uh, I'm sorry, the support data that the industry is going to need. So such as a budget impact model. And so we funded a small budget impact model last year. And what we learned from our working group was that the airlines want, wanted and needed more. And so as a small organization, we couldn't fund the level of research that they were looking for. And we worked closely with Congress. And now there is through the Mobile Act, which was introduced to the floor last month, um, there will be funding for a very large scale budget impact model on what a wheelchair spot how a wheelchair spot on airplanes will impact the aviation industry in total. Um, and so we're really looking forward to, to seeing um, that come to fruition. Other uh, support data is the medical papers we are now funding. Um, we did have a paper funded through uh, Cure Duchenne's and it was the first medical paper where uh, doctors wrote about why they should support a wheelchair spot on airplanes for their patients. And so that will be the very first building block on what we hope is more medical research um, in this space. Um, we do advocate um, for funding primarily when we go to the Hill. So we um, have secured funding for more uh, research and crash testing of wheelchairs to find out, um, can we use the, your current WC19 uh, wheelchairs? Um, that is also in the Mobile Act um, and we've also um, asked for a center of excellence for accessible air travel to be created. And that a press release actually just came out today from Senator Moran's office um, where uh, that will be um, housed. Um, so we're really proud of some of these really um, intricate um, progresses that we've been able um, to make on the, on the advocacy side. Um, but we also want to make sure that as a wheelchair user, you're also advocating for your own self-travel. And so, you know, we provide um, something called the Fly Safe Today program, and we give away, um, I don't know if you can see me, but we have these um, cards that we give out. They are, um, well, PVC cards. It has a QR code on the back. It's uh, the Bill of Rights for Airline Passengers with Disabilities that the DOT published. And that QR code will take you direct to um, that site. And so if you're on an airplane and you're traveling and you're having any pushback from the um, flight attendants or anyone else that's at the airport, it's advocacy in your pocket and just, you know, knowing your, your, your rights and what the laws are when traveling as a passenger with disabilities. And you can go to our website and um, there should be a link there um, for you to apply for this card. Um, and, you know, we, I know that, you know, everybody wants to travel and, Unfortunately, when you're um, someone who uses a wheelchair, it requires a lot of prep. And so what, you know, we ask of the community is, you know, think of your planning as extremely vital for your safety and pleasure. And so you will need to call the airlines. Um, unfortunately, you cannot just buy your ticket and expect everything to go smoothly. So before buying your ticket, I would call the airlines, make sure, um, they provide you which um, plane you're gonna be flying on and does your wheelchair fit through the um, cargo doors um, as well as once you get there, um, understanding that you will need to remove any removable parts of your wheelchair. And um, you, know, you can bring those on the airplane. Um, it's not counted as you know, extra luggage. And, you know, I would suggest wrapping your wheelchair and also documenting anything that you um, on, on your wheelchair, let them know the weight of your wheelchair, where you would like them to lift your wheelchair and remind them that, that this wheelchair is, you know, your mobility and you would 
please don't break it. Remind them that, you know, sort of that human factor side so they understand don't just throw it into the cargo hold. Not that they probably will be, it's very heavy. Um, after you get to your destination, if you yourself are injured from a lift or if you your wheelchair is damaged, please make a complaint and uh, um, submit your claims at the airport. Once you leave the airport, the airlines and the airport are no longer liable for helping you. Um, we've seen this time and time again, somebody has dropped, but they just wanna leave the airport and they are now hospitalized after that dropped and the airlines will not help fund for any of that hospital stay in care. So you definitely, you, we understand that it could ruin some a part of your trip, but if you are looking to make sure that you are getting that reimbursement, you have to make the claims when you're at the airport. Um, and then another important tool is TSA CARES. If you don't know about it, it is something that will help you get through the airport um, safer and easier. Um, and I think um, that really kind of takes us through some of the work that, that we are working on. Um, I think there was another question that um, C, uh, CMD did ask and it was you know asking about the locking down systems. And I just I wanted to explain while you know um, we are testing the current tie down systems at the end of the day, we still don't know what that final locking system will look like. There is a, a lot more work that needs to be done. Thanks, Michelle. All right, next we're going to hear from Sophie and Rob on adaptive snow and winter activities as spring and positive outlets. All right, so me and Rob are from the Adaptive Sports Center. We are based out of Crested Butte, Colorado, and we're gonna be about our winter programming. So to start off, I'm Sophie. I'm a logistics coordinator at the Adaptive Sports Center. And I deal specifically with the groups that join us in the winter time. Um, and pass it off to Rob. Awesome. Um, I am Rob Gunther. I'm the program manager with the Adaptive Sports Center. And um, I work really closely with our daily operations, but I also um, work with our individual uh, participants who come in. So that'd be people coming out for kind of like personal recreation or family trips. All right, so the Adaptive Sports Center's mission is to enhance the quality of life of people with disabilities through exceptional outdoor adventure activities. The successful programs the ASC provides are inclusive to families and friends empower our participants in their daily lives and have a positive and enduring effect on self-efficacy, health, independence, and overall well-being. Awesome. So um, in the winter, we offer uh, various activities, but we mostly focus on um, sliding on snow. And uh, that can look different for kind of every person. Um, if you look at the slide, we have a whole bunch of different ways um, to get people out onto Crestview Mountain Resort, which is our home resort. Um, and a big thing that we really focused on is using what people um, have in their abilities and mobility. And so we adapt each lesson um, to each specific person and their goals um, and really work to make it the experience that they want to have out on the snow. Um, we have various sit skis. We have um, uh, pieces of equipment called sliders that are similar to like walkers um, with skis attached so that we can get some muscul musculoskeletal support um, and still use some muscle function that our participants have. Um, and then we also have just traditional kind of stand up um, skiing and snowboarding. We have ski bikes, just a ton of different options to get people um, out and moving around. Um, part of our program I already mentioned um, we, we do exclusively private lessons. And so every lesson is focused towards each participant um, and their goals. And we execute that um, with a fully paid and certified staff. There are a ton of different adaptive winter programs out there who do amazing things with volunteer um, support. And we're really fortunate um, to have a, a paid and certified staff. And we feel that we're able to offer really um, strong experience for everybody who comes through our doors, just having that um, little bit of extra kind of like drive um, and ability to commit um, every day uh, 
to our program for our instructors. Um, we also work really hard to maintain um, a strong equipment fleet that's um, kind of up to date and current in all of the technology and um, kind of newest pieces of equipment, while also maintaining um, some more familiar pieces that people who have potentially been skiing for a really long time are um, comfortable and familiar with. And then part of um, part of this experience for people who are new to snow sports is it can be um, kind of scary. Um, there's a lot of unknowns and a lot of variables that uh, that we have to work with, and we try to manage it um, again with our our really passionate staff. But we also have an excellent relationship with our home resort, which is Crested Butte Mountain Resort, and um, we work really closely with their management team and lift operators to make sure that. Um, they kind of know how best to help us while we're out on the hill. Um, next, we'll be talking about planning your visit here. So there's two different avenues as Rob kind of touched on is we have groups that come in and then we also have individuals that come in. Um, to start with groups, we work specifically with veterans, rehabilitation hospitals and other organizations that serve people with disabilities. And these trips are typically planned out about a year in advance. Um, they're around five to seven days on average. So they have about three to five days of skiing and then two days of travel on either end. And our logistics team helps with both travel and transportation. So we'll be booking all of the flights for our groups and then also working on all of the shuttles to and from the airport or around the town of Crested Butte. Um, once they get to Crested Butte, we have accessible lodging here in our Kelsey Wright building, which is right on the mountain. And so it makes it really awesome for the participants to be right where their programming is happening. They just head downstairs and head out on lessons. And the lodging is 100% accessible. Um, and it's also in a very communal setup. And so all of the groups will have individual rooms for participants, but then they also have a big kitchen where they get to cook together in a living room, kind of commune together and get, get together as a group and kind of connect, which is a huge part of our group experience here, which I think is awesome. And then on the other side of that, um, I briefly touched on it, it would be our individual programming. And so um, again, this is for people looking to come out um, on their own trips, maybe it's a holiday trip, a spring break trip um, with their family or friends um, or potentially by themselves. And so that process, um, the booking process begins, we're shooting for kind of a September launch this year for our winter registration. And um, registration is open all the way through our season, which typically ends kind of the first week of April. And um, for individual programming, we work with uh, like your requested dates and when you're looking to come out and build your the, the schedule that you desire. Um, so long as we have kind of like the ability and capacity to offer lessons on those specific days. Um, the busier times do fill up a little bit more quickly than um, other times, but um, the individual travel process is separate from our group's travel process in that we don't, um, we don't provide flights or lodging, but we do provide resources um, to kind of help you get it there. And we we have discounted lodging through some partnerships um, around the town of Crested Butte and Gunnison. And then we also have some accessible lodging in um, our building as well that can be rented out at an affordable rate. Um, very similar lodging to what so uh, Sophie just described. And then to help with kind of the travel aspect. Um, we understand that winter sports and um, recreation in general can be really expensive and cost prohibitive. And we don't want anybody to not be able to experience the joy of skiing um, due to a financial barrier. And so we have recently introduced an access for all program um, for our organization. And basically what that does is it subsidizes our lesson costs down to $95 a day which includes instruction, equipment rental, and lift tickets. Um, I believe it's $85 for a half day lesson. And so that is below the lowest single day ticket price that anybody could walk up to the resort window and purchase. 
Um, and so we're really trying very hard to kind of make it approachable and accessible to get out here. Um, and then on top of our access for all program, we have a really strong pro uh, scholarship program as well. And so if you need further assistance with funding to make your trip happen, um, we ask that you submit an application and um, we are happy to provide additional financial assistance. All right, and then why is all of this important? So with winter sports specifically, it's very versatile. We have so many adaptions that we can use in our program that helps us serve many populations. And then with that, it's also very empowering for our participants. I think a lot of people come in thinking, uh, maybe I can't do this, it's gonna be really hard, it's gonna be scary, and they end up surprising themselves and it instills them in a really powerful, confident way. And I think that that's really awesome for them. And the hope is that that trickles into their personal life. So it's not just about the skiing um, and being out there in the snow, it's about carrying that on into their individual life and instilling that confidence that they can do anything that they want to do. They just have to put their mind to it. Um, and also it just provides a community this program, we have people that come back year after year after year, um, both for individuals and groups, and it gives them an awesome community to grow in and be understood and have shared experiences with. Um, and so overall winter is just, it's inclusive, it's empowering, it's vers versatile, and it's super fun. So it's very, very important. And then um, lastly, we're running a little short on time, but um, CMD also wanted us to kind of touch on um, the ability to, to get some winter equipment on your own. And really the best way that we've found is to um, find a program that offers the sport that you're looking for and get some instruction, try out various different pieces of equipment and see what really works best for you. Um, and then there are a ton of granting organizations out there that work um, specifically with um, adaptive sports equipment. And um, one of the benefits of visiting a program such as ours is um, those granting programs really like to see that um, people have tried the piece of equipment that they're that they're looking for um, and be able to show that, like, you know, I've, I've taken lessons with this piece of equipment. I know that it works well with me and I know um, how to operate it in the future. And um, so I can go a really long way. But there we're one of many programs out there. and. Um, there are some awesome resources to kind of, kind of find um, programs that are, that are closer to you um, if we are a little bit far, farther away so you can experience the, the joys of being out on the mountain in winter. Thanks, Rob and Sophie. All right, so now Patrick is going to take us through the impos impossible dream catamaran and why it is so unique. Hi, thank you, Avery and Kelly. Thank you for having us uh, to this uh, webinar. And um, I'm, today I'm going to talk a little bit about my background as a disabled sailor and some ideas for adaptive sailing around the country. And then we're also going to talk about um, an event that we're partnering with the Impossible Dream Catamaran with um, a Cure CMD group out of uh, Liberty Landing in Jersey City. Okay, so um, um, my um, adaptive sailing adventure began in Chicago back in 2008. Um, there are a number of uh, pretty big uh, sailing, adaptive sailing centers located all across the country and um, the one I began with was in Chicago. Um, these sailing centers use boats that are uh, specifically adapted for a disabled sailor. Um, most of them have uh, some sort of uh, seat with a seat belt situation that can kind of hang on to you so that you can go out and enjoy being out on the water in any kind of condition, you know, including a, a windy, wavy day. Um, and um, I would encourage you, if you're going to be traveling, to you know take a look at some of the bigger locations. I know that Boston, Newport, Rhode Island, uh, uh, Annapolis, Maryland, uh, Miami, 
Florida has uh, a program there called Shake a Leg, uh, the program. So, um, so there are a number of smaller, uh, yeah, organizations all over on the West Coast in San Francisco and San Diego. Um, wherever you're going to be traveling to, if you're interested in sailing, if there's a beautiful bay or some water you want to go out on, I would suggest uh, Googling adaptive sailing and then that location and reaching out to that group. Um, usually they will have docks that are ADA compliant, um, so they're easy to get to. They'll have a number of different ways that you can maybe transfer um, onto the boat and um, a number of different kinds of boats that have seats that are comfortable to be in and you would be going out with like an instructor or volunteer who's uh, an experienced person like that. So um, for myself, um, in my experience, um, I was born with spina bifida and um, I had a, a number of, I'm a wheelchair user now, I had a, over a dozen corrective surgeries in my youth up to about age 19. And, um, but I didn't really pick up sailing until I turned 40. Um, and um, it really helped me become um, part of a, of a community of adaptive sailors. You know, we had a couple of things in common, you know, our love for sailing and our disability. Um, you know, it was great to uh, interact with them. It was fun, the camaraderie around the the sailing center was always fun to be with. I had made, met and still have a lot of friends from there. And um, for me, um, I came out for my first lesson in 2008 and um, it was a really windy day, but I like I had was in the seat and I felt pretty comfortable and I really had a lot of fun doing that. Um, I, I've learned how to do uh, racing in different adaptive boat, boats. Um, uh, the um, we have a number of uh, regattas that uh, are adaptive regattas that are hosted around the country in different locations in Chicago and Newport, Rhode Island, and so on. And um, so I would encourage you, you know, to try to get out on 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 a boat and uh, and and do that. Um, I got my instructor certification from U.S. Sailing in 2013, and um, I was able to be an instructor at our program in Chicago. Um, and we, we take out um, all sorts of uh, people with all kinds of disabilities and being out on the water is freeing. Uh, there's a certain healing quality to it. Um, it's fun to just be in a nice quiet sailboat moving through the water. It's very calm and peaceful and rejuvenating. And, um, and uh, I would recommend it. You know, you could just seek it out and see if you could find it in a community that's close to you. Um, the other thing that uh, I was want to talk about today is the um, the job that I'm currently doing as program coordinator for the Impossible Dream Cat Catamaran. Um, I was able to go out um, as a wheelchair user on this uh, Impossible Dream Catamaran in, in 2020, and then I started working for them last year as the program coordinator. So um, the Impossible Dream Catamaran is a 58-foot um, barrier-free wheelchair-accessible catamaran, and uh, we this will be our uh, ninth annual tour. We take it on a summer tour for five months every year, um, and we go from Miami and stop in a number of different ports. We go all the way up to Portland, Maine, and then come back down again. Uh, last year, we stopped in over 18 ports. And we offer, um, we have sponsors that we partner with, and we offer, um, you know, about like a two to three hour long sail on board um, this catamaran. And um, it's, it's uh, a very unique experience. Um, the boat was designed and built from the ground up uh, from a general, uh, from in England, uh, a gentleman named Mike Brown uh, was the original owner. And then 10 years ago, uh, my our CEO and founder, Deborah Mellon, bought the catamaran. And her idea was to you know, make it a nonprofit and share it with the disability community. And so for seven months out of the year, we are located at the Shake-A-Lake Adaptive Sailing Center in Miami, Florida. 
It's in Coconut Grove, about a couple of miles south of downtown Miami. And uh, we offer community sales there. Um, you can also go out in some of those smaller boats, like I mentioned earlier, if you wanted to just do um, like, uh, an, a, uh, like a more personal excursion. And um, so the, the impossible dream, um, the, our motto is that, you know, traditionally sailing is an activity that's only been um, uh, limited to people who are able-bodied. If you have a disability, if you're a wheelchair user, there aren't many ways, it's kind of difficult to get out on, on the water. But um, the impossible dream takes something that is, you know, traditionally very difficult and it makes it actually possible, right? And so um, the, um, we have a series of hydraulic lifts and ramps on board the boat. Um, the boat can be um, sailed uh, with, a, with a completely uh, disabled crew. In fact, there's a gentleman named Jeff Holtz. He set a world record as a quadriplegic. He sailed Impossible Dream uh, across the Atlantic in 2010 and set a world record. Um, so everything on the boat um, is accessible for a wheelchair, but it's, it's, it's more than that. Like we can actually raise and lower our sails with um, just by pressing a button and uh, we can wrap the lines around what's called a round winch and then hit a button and that will trim the sail in or ease the sail out uh, and just by hitting buttons. Um, we also, um, offer uh, um, the um, holes of the boat are also accessible. So you can get um, down into where we have our sleeping quarters and what we call our head, which is our bathroom. And um, they, uh, you know, they're all, they're all accessible and it was designed and built that way from the ground up. So, um, so the, the partnership that we have with CureCMD um, is going to lead us to um, an opportunity for um, the CureCMD community to come out for a sale on board uh, the Impossible Dream on uh, June 24th. I know Avery and Kelly have probably reached out and um, to let you guys know that already. And so um, we're, we're excited to get you guys on board. For our, our day sales, we usually have between like 16 to 18 uh, guests on board. And um, you can actually um, stroll, um, roll all the way up to the, the bow of the boat. Um, and you can really feel the wind and you could be sitting right underneath the sails and everything is very accessible, uh, very easy to do. So um, as I mentioned, we, we do our summer voyage um, this year, we're going to be stopping in uh, Baltimore, Maryland. We're going to be in Jersey City, as I mentioned, with, and partnering with CureCMD. We're also going to be out um, far out on Long Island in Greenport, New York, and in Martha's Vineyard, then Boston, Portland, Maine, uh, Newport, Rhode Island, uh, Kingston, New York, which is um, a couple hours north of New York City on the Hudson. And then in the fall and September, we're going to be back in uh, Brooklyn. And then in October, we're going to spend uh, some more time in the Chesapeake in uh, back in Baltimore and Annapolis. So if you guys are located, if anyone's located in, in, near any of those uh, ports that we're going to be, feel free to reach out and we will do our best to get you on board for a sale. Um, so some of our programs that we offer, right, the summer voyage, but we also have been involved in uh, a number of uh, distance races, um, our racing for awareness, where we race with uh, a mixed ability crew. Uh, we usually have three or four people, uh, wheelchair users and uh, or power chair users. And then um, our captain is able-bodied. There are a few things that, um, are helpful to have an able-bodied person on boat normally. Um, so we've raced from St. Petersburg to um, Isla Mujeres, Mexico, Mexico, which is Cancun. We raced from Fort Lauderdale to uh, Key West, and we raced from Key West to Havana, 
we usually do one or two races um, a year on board. Um, and uh, so that's something that we've done. We also have opportunities for um, guest crew. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, we, we sail with a, a mixed ability crew, some uh, wheelchair users um, and disabled people and some able-bodied, right? So, um, uh, and all of our um, accommodations uh, are, are designed for uh, dis disabled people. So it's to get down into the halls um, where the sleeping quarters and the bathrooms are, we actually have um, a hydraulic lift that can be operated by the person in the wheelchair. So you don't have to ask every time you wanna go up and down, you can kind of do it whenever you need to. Um, and the, the berths, are, our beds where we sleep are easy to transfer over to those. Um, and we usually take guest crew on our uh, summer tour voyage um, on legs in between each, each one of those ports. We have um, some of our guest crew hop on and um, sail with us for a few days, um, some of them up to a couple of weeks at a time. And um, they are an active part of the crew. They stand watch when we're doing um, distance sailing or overnight sailing um, and they you can see um, that guest crew person is uh, our helm is, is set up ideally for a, um, a wheelchair user to uh, accommodate them and make that super easy. And then our winter programming, as I mentioned, in Florida. Uh, and then where we go. So we go um, up and down the um, East Coast. These are an example of some of the ports that we stop at. Um, and, um, yeah, and then we also, the different communities that we serve, um, we, we do, we do try to spend a time with, um, uh, rehab hospitals. That's sort of one of our, um, specialties. We, what we, what we try to do is take people who are, uh, newly injured. Um, and maybe in a re rehab institution going through months of rehab. And we, we try to get them on board to see, you know, to have them experience something that, you know, they may have thought at one point would be impossible to go back out on the water in an easy and fun way. And to see that, you know, anything is actually possible. Um, and that is, and partnering with, um, impossible dream. We, um, we really kind of depend on um, our partners and they help sponsor us. Um, and um, part of that, what they do is, is they, they give us the ability to offer community sales in some of our smaller ports that we go to, um, to, to people that might not be the uh, individuals in the disability community that might not be part of a larger organization like Cure CMD. Um, and so um, the, the sponsorships help with, with that um, part of it. And here's our team. Um, Deborah Mellon was really our founder. She has been our leader for the last 10 years. Um, she experienced a spinal cord injury in Italy in 1989. And um, she learned how to sail at um, Shake Lake in Miami, that adaptive sailing center located there, who um, Harry Horgan next to her, um, he is the founder of Shake Lake in Miami and um, they've been offering adaptive sailing there for 30 years. So Deborah and Harry have sort of uh, partnered. We have our captain Will our, and our different uh, couple board members and myself there. Thank you for the opportunity, Avery and Kelly, and uh, I look forward to your question. Thanks, Patrick. All right, so unfortunately, Caleb and Brock could not join us live, um, but they sent in a pre-recording that they'd like us to share with you all, um, focusing on their mission and how they have made surfing accessible to all abilities. Hi, I'm Brock Johnson from Adaptive Surf Project. I'm the vice president and uh, one of the founders of what we got what we are doing. And I'm Caleb Reed. I'm the uh, project coordinator with Adaptive Surf Project as well. 
so yeah, we're here to, today to talk a little bit about Adaptive Surf Project and uh, what we do and why we think it, it matters. And so uh, to give you an idea of what we're up to, at Adaptive Surf Project, our mission is to inspire and nurture inclusive communities that improve lives through adaptive surfing. And we're envisioning a world where we can come together to create a world where it's normal to see adaptive and traditional surfers sharing the same surf break. That's um, kind of the central thing that we're trying to accomplish as a group. And uh, how we do that really centers primarily around our, our flagship event, which is called Wheel to Surf, which is an event that uh, Brock actually started. And so I want Brock to talk to you guys a little bit about, about Wheel to Surf and how it came about. Yeah, I got involved with this um, after right after my accident. I had an accident in 2011, um, quadriplegic, and uh, I went, was fortunate to go to the Shepherd in Atlanta, and I learned all about adaptive sports, um, just trying new things, trying to do something, you know, uh, active, involved with other people, you know, like, like me, and surfing is one of my favorite pastimes before my accident. Um, and so it was one of the first things I wanted to get back to doing. Uh, so I researched it. I found one event in, in Wilmington. And uh, within like a year and a half, I was back in the water surfing again. Um, I was just, and that day it just clicked to me. A light bulb went off. Like uh, we don't have this in South Carolina and, or Myrtle Beach more specifically. And so um, I just thought to myself, I, I, I could make this happen. I call it wheel to surf. Um, I started it for people like myself with spinal cord injuries or or in wheelchairs. Um, and I think of it as like you have to wheel yourself out there. You have to have the will to wheel yourself out there and jump in the water with us. And um, it's all all inclusive for anyone with any type of disability, any age. Um, we we welcome everybody. It's free of charge. Um, we uh, nothing you ever do with us is, is has a fee. Um, we have trained surf instructors. We have medical professionals. Um, we have lifeguards. We have all kinds of things to make it safe for everyone to be able to do it. And lots of volunteers. We run run five teams. Um, it's a color coordinated event. And I try to keep it as organized as we can. Our flagship event, of course, is uh, Wheel to Surf, and yes, it's a joint venture between Adaptive Surf Project and then uh, our sister organization, Coastal Adaptive Sports. And um, but uh, for Adaptive Surf Project, you know, we're of course really focused on on the beach, uh, uh, beach accessibility, um, and and surfing. And so, yeah, we uh, not only do we do our Wheel to Surf events, which is kind of our main main thing but we also have uh we have surfers like brock who compete uh, at the national and international level the highest levels of adaptive surfing uh so we train for that and we take uh take people to competitions we also uh feel like it's really important to spread the stoke as we say of what we do to not just uh serve only our local community but uh go out to other communities and help train adaptive surf uh teams and and uh people interested in starting their own uh adaptive surf events we uh help them get started and so we've had some success doing that in uh costa rica and in colombia south america uh in north carolina and um we're working on doing some others here um uh, in the Carolinas as well. And so that's a big part of what we do. For outreach, our end goal was to, you know, help with them, you know, teach them to do it, teach them, teach instructors, and then uh, they'll teach, they can continue to teach others. Exactly, exactly. One, one thing that I always feel like is important to share with everybody is that um, we know that our community really is the the magic of what we're doing. And you can't just replicate the magic of real relationships and connection and all that it has that part has to be organic um and so uh like we said the idea is that we we get a model that other people can then infuse with their own personal relationships and particularities of their own community and really um recreate that part in their own image uh as well and that that's really um that's the most beautiful part of what we're doing, I think, is the, the awesome community that we've been able to to grow into here. Yeah, yeah. Building the family is, is the best part. Yeah, like we all 
uh, love each other. We like to hang out with each other when we're not surfing. You know, we become a big family. Yeah, like uh, we said, you know, the beach accessibility uh, is is another component of what we're doing. So, um, you know, here locally, we've been focused on installing more uh, beach matting so that people in wheelchairs can get on the uh, on the beach much easier and and in more places. Uh, and then also we have a big push to um, put beach wheelchairs at, uh, we're trying to get a beach wheelchair at every pier on the East Coast. Uh, the idea is that when you see a, when you see a pier, you know there's a chair there. And um, so, yeah, th those are just some other ways that we're trying to make the whole beach experience more accessible, accessible to all. And um, yeah, yeah, ac accessibility is it's become, become one of our other projects. Uh, we just see the need. Yeah. Yeah. So if, um, you know, anybody who, who might be on this uh, webinar or in, in this network, um, you know, if you are local to or willing to travel to um, the Myrtle Beach area, that's where we have our um, our Wheel to Surf events. In August, we'll be having our next event. And yeah, so um, we'd love to have anybody to sign up for one of those events. And again, we'll get you the information about how to how to sign up for that um, as it nears. Uh, but yeah, what you can expect to come to an event is is um, you sign up, you show up, you'll get a time slot, and uh, whether you've surfed before or not, um, you'll you'll get a chance to get in the water, and we will adapt uh, the surf session, usually a twenty minute surf session, to your needs. So whether you need to surf uh, prone, like on on your stomach, that's how that's how Brock sur surfs. Yeah. Um, if you need to surf with uh, with an instructor on the board with you. Um, if you yeah. surf standing, uh, wh whatever the case may be, if you uh, have have done it or not, uh, we can make it happen. And so um, it's a great way to just get a taste of the the magic of of what surfing is. So we'd love to have love to have you guys at an event sometime. Thank you so much, uh, Caleb and Bra. All right. So next, Ian will share what he is doing to help bridge the gap um, between making the outdoors more inclusive for all. Uh, thanks for having me, guys. I'm going to uh, try to be quick, and uh, mainly I'm going to tell you about uh, our nonprofit, what we do, and before that, I have to tell you a little about my backstory and how that nonprofit was formed. So um, I'm, a, I'm a spinal cord injury. I'm a C2, C3, and um, in, in 2008 is when I was riding home from college, was going a little fast on my bicycle, hit a tree, broke my neck, and... Uh, you know, started learning how to live my life as a, a high level quad for, you know, for the last 15 years. Um, I was miserable when I went home. I mean, I spent probably two or three years uh, just sitting around watching a lot of Andy Griffith show and, um, you know, playing some computer games. And it, it really wasn't me and it didn't feel, I don't know, it didn't feel fulfilling and I, I needed more. And so what I did is I finally, um, I, I, I found a, a bike path just down my street, maybe a quarter mile, and I started exploring it. And uh, soon I was seeing, you know, the first crocus pop up of the season or, um, you know, the goldfinch, first goldfinch come in in spring. And, uh, you know, my background was was biology. And so so these things kind of you know, reignited my, um, I don't know, my interest in life. And I kind of found my solace out, out on that trail. And uh, I, I met some other folks that were really living their lives, and I decided that uh, I needed to do something bigger. And so in um, eight years after <laughs> I was injured, in 2016, I decided I wanted to go for a, a really long ride and, and ride my wheelchair from um, basically Canada down across the state of Washington State into Oregon to Portland. That was about 300 miles over over 10 days, maybe 350 miles. And uh, it was spectacular, right? I was out there, again, really living my, my life. And I, um, I loved bike touring before I was injured. And I didn't think that was available to me anymore. But I just found a, um, you know, a, a different way to do it. And I reached out to those bike touring buddies and said, hey, would you be interested in, in joining me for this, this long ride? And, you know, see, I had just moved up here from California, uh, you know, before my injury and to see a new state at seven miles per hour, it was so charming and, and the, the Americana of, uh, uh, you know, of, of big tractors going by or just grandmothers on their porches waving at you. It was, 
it was it was spectacular and we raised uh, a bunch of money for um an organization related to trails in our area and uh you know, it just became a lot bigger than me. The governor invited me to go talk with him about more access throughout the, the state after this ride was done. And we realized that we needed to uh, to continue this. And we started a nonprofit called, called Ian's Ride. And so our mission is kind of threefold. It's uh, based on technology because, well, we've consulted with Apple for the past uh, seven or eight years. And um, really we could not, I, I could not do what I do if I didn't have access to, uh, you know, to to a phone and good good tech. And so it's been really beneficial helping with them. But we also we also have a support aspect. Um, a lot of times paralysis and uh, mobility impairments are just too challenging to deal with to yourself. And it's nice to share with with others. But mostly, or what I really love is kind of the outdoor access um, aspect of our of our nonprofit. And we. Um, you know, I, I did that big ride. I saw the need for, for more of those. I met so many other wheelchair users along the way. And so um, we, we started to do a bunch of smaller events. Uh, the uh, Several of them are just starting this year, um, but Ride to Homa and Ride the Ridge, those are both, uh, Ride to Homa is Mount Rainier. It'll be our seventh annual ride this year. And uh, Ride the Ridge is up on, um, it's it's on the Olympic mountain range in the Olympic National Park. But it's just really fun to bring um, a bunch of like-minded people out together onto a trail and uh, and let them you know, explore. And, and we, we bring a bunch of volunteers to, to help push if someone's battery runs out or their arms are, are too tired. We have access points to pull out. So people could do, you know, kind of a choose your own adventure of the length. Usually up to 20 miles or so is the, is the top length. But, you know, after doing that, that really big ride, I also wanted to offer something similar to others. And so our flagship event is called Sea to Sound. And um, Sea to Sound covers 75 miles of the Olympic Discovery Trail here in Washington State over three days. And what we do is we, um, you know, have shuttle services and a fleet of wheelchair vans uh, to you know, to really help people feel confident about about exploring and about uh, pushing their limits. We have aid stations every five miles and places for people to uh, to hop off the ride then. We have charging stations. We have, you know, music for lunch. And it's just a really fun, fun three-day affair. Uh -uh. And, you know, it's it, this, this area that we're in, it's, you know, it's pretty spectacular. I mean, there's giant trees everywhere. You're on the banks of amazing rivers and, and crossing these huge, huge bridges, which, which can just be spectacular. I mean, I think we have about 100 participants per year and you know, around 30 to 40 wheelchairs. And I mean, we have people of all ages. I mean, there's little kids that are out there joining us and uh, in, in their chairs there's we've had a hundred and 102 year old woman with us last year and to have a you know a centennial out there to uh, uh to be riding along makes it makes it feel really special and i guess one other um neat aspect about the ride that we've been able to do is uh, we are partnered with with Invacare and, and Motion Concepts, and they provide us like three or four power wheelchairs, um, and and we reach out to local dignitaries in our uh, in our area, be it mayors or county commissioners or anyone who has some influence on um, I don't know on on voting on policy that would better uh, you know access for us, particularly on on trails. And anyway, that's been that's been really successful, and um, we've got a a spot now talking about um, the Olympic Discovery Trail with the county commissioners in our our area, and it's really cool to have an ear and to be a voice uh, you know, for our community there. Um, oh, here's probably another picture. Yeah, here's that 102 year old woman down here on the bottom left with her her scarf and mask. Um, but. Uh, yeah, and again, all abilities, it's, it's really fun over, over three days. But another thing that our, our organization does is often just show what's possible. And so I've done a, a bunch of other fun rides. I've driven across, ridden across Washington from east to west. And just this past year, I got to do the easternmost 500 miles of the Great American Rail Trail from DC to Columbus, Ohio. 
really spectacular and just to demonstrate that that infrastructure is a, a safe and um, plausible uh, route for power wheelchairs or or other wheelchairs is pretty cool. But then um, also last year in June, I went after a, a Guinness World Record and it was the furthest distance traveled in 24 hours in a power wheelchair. I managed 184.4 miles. It was a miserable, miserable day. Uh, doing anything for 24 hours is just sucks. But uh, I mean, it, it felt amazing too. You know, you you finish this thing and you'd spent months and months preparing and yeah, it was a miserable day, but uh, I was elated when it was done and I got to do it with so many wonderful people around me and um, hearing about how that encouraged others and how they really wanted to better other people wanted to better their chair and do similar things was hugely motivating. And in fact, this past Wednesday, um, I got to go visit another town in Washington where a woman was uh, was attempting a very similar record, but it was with a chin drive and she actually got a little bit further, about 191 miles. And I couldn't be uh, couldn't be happier about it, right? If if imitation is the greatest form of flattery, then I couldn't be couldn't be more flattered. And I got to be there with her, and she's nonverbal CP and just an amazing, amazing woman. All right, I'm trying to wrap things up here. I guess the last thing I want to just leave you with is just some accessible outdoor recreation ideas that that we value. And you know, we often these offer these group rides, and we encourage people. To, to join us and people do from all all over, all over the country, especially for a sea to sound. But just in your hometown, you know, I, I really love rail trails and bike paths. I think they're a great uh, outlet, a way to access nature and uh, I don't know, just just a fun way to, to meet some community. Uh, Arboretums, national and state parks, again, my biology background might be pushing these, but I've um, found them to be great spots to, uh, to explore and have some fun. But there's a lot of other groups that do neat just uh, monthly rides or something. Reach out to your area and uh, uh, you know and see and see what's out there because it's fun to go out there with your peers and be with like-minded individuals out in the uh, in the world. Yeah, but sometimes we're only able to do what we can do, right? And so just be in your backyard. Just get outside, right? Spend some time out there. It, uh, it feels amazing. Again, it's where I found my solace and I do all I can to encourage others to, uh, to go have fun out there. Anyway, I'll leave it with that and hope you guys are well. Thank you so much, Ian. All right, now Alvaro is willing to explain um, Will the World's mission as an online platform specifically catered towards the needs of travelers with disabilities. Thank you, Avery. So hello, everyone. Um, I'm, I'm very excited to, to be part of this amazing event, being super inspired by, by all the talks. And yes, my name is Alvaro Silverstein. And um, I am originally from Chile. I live in Berkeley, California, uh, and I'm one of the founders of Will the World. I am um, a C5-6 quadriplegic, um, I am two, I am 37 years old. I, I was injured in a car accident when I was 18. Um, and, uh, and always travel has been close to my heart. And also, of course, uh, having a disability is challenging, but it's possible. Um, and, and that inspired me to... to uh, to found willtheworld.com, uh, that it's a, an accessible travel booking platform uh, that we focus on gathering detailed and verified information of accessibility and a user experience that always put accessibility at the forefront. Uh, the story around Will the World started because uh, with some friends, we started organizing a trip um, to Patagonia uh, in my hometown country, Chile. Uh, we started figuring out how to do a trip that is very famous there that is called visiting the, the Torres del Paine National Park, one of the eight wonders of the world. Uh, and when we started organizing this trip, we realized that nobody else in a wheelchair did this trip before. And there was like zero information about how someone in a wheelchair would uh, 
would explore this beautiful place. Um, and um, we we identified that there was like a, a, a hiking wheelchair that was manufactured in France that could allow us to do this, this, this trek, that it was a five day trek through the mountains of Patagonia. Uh, this, this, this wheelchair cost $5,000. We didn't have the money to buy it. So that was the moment that we decided to transform our trip into a project saying let's become the first group ever with a wheelchair user to complete the W trek in Patagonia. But uh, with the focus and with the uh, goal to then open the doors to other people to repeat this trip because we would leave this uh, wheelchair uh, in this destination. We will train uh, tour operators on how to use this wheelchair and then we will uh, uh, raise the information on where to stay, how to move around so other people had the information to repeat it. We did this trip, we fundraised the, 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 the wheelchair. The trip was my best experience of my life. I was there in the middle of this amazing nature, uh, admiring um, this beautiful place. Um, it was a moment for me that I realized that I could do anything, even having a, a severe disability. Um, and also it was amazing for my friends. They were pushing me um, through the through these hikes. We were having so much fun. And um, but the more and, and, and we filmed a documentary about our trip that you can find it online on YouTube. Uh, and with this documentary, our story went pretty viral. And, and in a in, in few months, hundreds of people started reaching out saying, Oh, how cool that trip that Alvaro did. I also have a disability. I also would love to explore Patagonia. And because we had the information how to do this trip, we started organizing this trip to other people, people from California, people from Australia, from Florida, from Brazil, from Europe. Uh, in, in, in six months, we allow more than uh, 80 people to, to repeat uh, this trip. Um, and, and, and firstly, we realized that Traveling is, travel is challenging, right? Not only getting to the end of the world um, uh, in, a, in a crazy adventure, but also finding accessible hotels uh, in Seattle or finding the things to do in Miami or in Madrid, right? Um, and and, and, and people, are, people with disabilities in general face several challenges when traveling. And we think that First, it is, it is an information problem, right? There's, yes, there's limited accessibility offer in the travel industry in terms of lodging, transportation services and activities, but there are, uh, and it's hard to, to find them. I mean, there's an information problem. It's the infor accessibility information is not online. Secondly, every disability has a spectrum. That means that accessibility needs differ on each person. So this information needs to be very detailed so anyone can understand if that uh, facility or that offer fits their specific needs. And the third thing is that the travel industry in general, they don't know if they have, how accessible are their services. So it's needed that someone explain them and train them on how to serve people with disabilities and how to understand how accessible their services, their facilities are, and how they can improve their accessibility. So that's why we founded Wheel the World on 2018. And at wheeltheworld.com, we allow people with disabilities and their families to find and book uh, accessible travel experiences. At wheeltheworld.com, you can find and book um, uh, places to stay, things to do, multi-day trips that considers accessible um, uh, accommodations, transportation, and activities. We also offer group tours. Um, and our value proposition is that we are collecting in detail the information of accessibility of everything that we that we uh, offer. Um, and through technology, our, uh, we can uh, recommend our users what best fits their specific, their specific needs. And we can guide them through the booking process and also through during their trips to provide like a, an accessibility focused customer support. Um, and, and how we make this happen is through technology. We build an app that we call the accessibility mapping system. So we, got, we are collaborating with tour operators, with hotel chains uh, to collect the data of accessibility in detail. 
the width of the doors, the height of the bed, if there's a bath accessible bathrooms or not, if there's assistance, how the transportation is. And we are collecting all these data points and we also like provide them like a report so they can understand how is their accessibility and how they can improve it. And we list their services at willtheworld.com with all this information so our customers understand uh, what's the accessibility of what we offer at willtheworld.com. And to allow them to have like a, a customized experience to our users at willtheworld.com, when, uh, when, when they sign up, they build their accessibility needs profile, stating what are their specific needs uh, as a disabled traveler uh, that they need to, to book a hotel, a transportation method or an activity. So our system, what we're building is that a recommendation engine that we can recommend users what best fits their specific needs. And we provide like a customer support that we guarantee the accessibility that they're booking online. So far, more than 4,000 people has booked trips with us uh, from 14 different countries around the world. 80% of our uh, customers has come from the US. Uh, something in interesting, like 40% um, of our users are disabled people, right? They're normally travel with two companions. So 60% of our uh, customer has been people without disabilities that also need accessibility because they travel with a loved one. And normally, like half of the times, is the companion the ones who, who does the booking through our platform. And um, we have made these 4,000 people travel to more than 200 destinations around the world. The US, Canada, Chile, Mexico, Costa Rica, Europe, Africa, uh, you name it, They're doing several activities and, and, and going to plenty of, of places. And, and we also have built a community of, uh, of around 80,000 people. Uh, you can find a, a, a Facebook group in, in Facebook uh, and also through our platform. Uh, sharing uh, feedback on how to travel with disabilities, providing uh, guidance, uh, and also sharing sharing how, how it feels to, to travel as a disabled person. So I also invite you to, to, to go to our Facebook group in, uh, of, 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 of disabled travelers. Um, and, and that's pretty much what we do. What we do is um, uh, empower people with disabilities to travel the world. Uh, I, after my my trip to Patagonia, I realized that this was my life mission on how I can help uh, people go and travel and go places. Um, and I want to give you like um, uh, to everyone who is here, like panelists and also people who are part of uh, who are like attendees, uh, a 100 credit uh, in your first accessible trip booked at willtheworld.com. Uh, you can go to the link that I just put. Uh, in the message, you can sign up through that link, uh, and once you book, you you uh, we we will give you a one hundred uh, dollars discount. I'm super excited to be part of this. Uh, I leave also my email there there because I really want to collaborate with the rest of the panelists and anyone that, that wants to reach out to me uh, to make travel more accessible uh, and make the world more accessible. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alvaro. Okay, so now Kevin is going to touch on how his mission to travel abroad transpired into a whole adaptive initiative to create a product that helps others do the same. Hey, thanks, Avery. Um, yeah, my name is Kevin Chandler, and we're going to, um, in 2016, uh, some friends and I went to Europe. Um, just as a lot of people do with their friends. Um, but because I have a disease called spinal muscular atrophy and I'm in a wheelchair, um, we realized all the things that we wanted to do were not traditionally uh, accessible. Um, we wanted to uh, climb uh, an island uh, off the coast of Ireland, for example, and uh, the boat to get there wouldn't be accessible, and the island definitely was not either. There was a very, very old monastery at the top that we went to see, and um, and so things like that. And uh, and so we decided rather than 
rather than uh, deciding that the world um, was uh, not accessible for Kevin, um, not Kevin friendly, we decided it was just not wheelchair friendly. So we left my wheelchair at home and um, we made a backpack, a custom customized backpack for my friends to carry me in for three weeks um, as we explored France, England, and Ireland. Um, there's a couple pictures there. You see the Eiffel Tower and then in the bottom uh, right hand corner, the island of, of Skellig Michael where we went as well. <laughs> and um, going on this trip, the other hurdle that we had besides accessibility uh, was the funding. We, um, we were all musicians and uh, middle school history teachers. And so uh, we, we didn't really have the funds to make this kind of trip happen uh, the way that we felt it needed to be done. So we um, created a, a GoFundMe profile and we started um, sharing it with our friends and saying, hey, can you help us make this trip happen? And uh, that led to some news and interviews and that uh, kind of caught fire. And, and um, by the time we were going on the trip, um, we were not only funded for it, but we also had a, a worldwide audience watching us uh, do this crazy experiment of um, going where where my wheelchair could not. And so uh, we had this amazing time. Um, we danced in the streets of Paris. We uh, hopped over fences in the English countryside and um, got to see uh, this ancient monastery that um, I had wanted to see for a long time. Um, I, I had always wanted to go to Europe um, and I had spent my life um, playing in bands and going on road trips and um, really doing a lot of travel and thinking outside the box uh, when it came to travel, but um, never overseas and never leaving my chair behind entirely. And um, so I give a lot of credit to the friends who went with me. A lot of it was uh, them saying, no, I think we can do this, you know? Um, uh, there were moments when I, I would, uh, would think, wow, this is, this is a bad idea, or this is um, going to be impossible. And um, I, I'm typically a hopeful, forward-thinking person, but even I hit those walls, and um, that's when these friends would step in and not just carry me in a backpack, but um, carry me emotionally as well. And um, my job in that was to also care for them and be present with them. And, um, and so, yeah, we did this thing together. And uh, as some of the other uh, people today have shared, um, community uh, was such a key part of this. Um, and it, it really happened because of um, my friends and, and family and, and the people around me um, and us doing this together. So because we had an audience going into the trip and people watching, following us online throughout the trip, um, we ended up getting uh, kind of in, inundated with um, questions from families all over the world, um, hundreds of families uh, with disabilities saying, uh, well, they had two questions. One was, where did you get this backpack and where did you get these friends? And so, um, we, when we got back from Europe, we started the nonprofit We Carry Kevin uh, in order to answer those two questions. Um, so the first one, where did you get this backpack? Uh, we worked with a company in Germany called Deuter uh, to develop um, a backpack based on what we had done in my parents' kitchen with a, an exacto knife and some some styrofoam and. Uh, and really worked with them to create a, a more official, professional, um, you know, developed product. And uh, that would be adjustable for all different kinds of needs. And we um, made that available in uh, the summer of 2018. Um, and then we, um, uh, to answer the second question, we, decided that whoever reached out about a backpack 
um, would also get uh, a friend, basically. <laughs> um, and we didn't know how to answer the question of where did you get these friends? I, I didn't have a, a five-step program on how to make friends. Um, I know a, a lot of people in the world have tried to do that for a very long time, and um, it just didn't seem to be the, the way that I wanted to do that. Um, but what I felt we could do is say, well, well, we don't have a step-by-step -step program, but we'll be your friends, and, and let's start there, and let's give you an example and um, maybe even create a space for you to, to meet other people and um, give you opportunity to um, engage with the world around you. And so, yeah, everyone that reaches out about a backpack, um, we stay in touch with, we engage um, all over the world. Um, so as of right now, we have about uh, 900 backpacks in 39 countries, and that means 900 families um, that are getting to uh, really think outside the box in, in a new way um, with accessibility and, um, and getting to go out and see things that they otherwise wouldn't have been able to. Um, and also what we've found from this, um, well, we've, we've experienced a lot of things. Um, one is uh, that um, they are doing even crazier things than I, I would have ever done. Um, we've seen, well, you, there's some pictures there. You see uh, uh, in the top left corner, um, just over one, there's uh, uh, two people out by a lake. Um, with the mountains behind them, and, and they are in Argentina, um, and uh, the man ordered the backpack um, a couple of years ago, and when we said, yeah, what, what, do you, what are you getting it for, because um, we like to know the, the backstory of how people are going to use this, what their dreams are, and, and their vision for adventure, and he said, well, I'm getting it because um, my wife is in a wheelchair, and or my, my fiance is in a wheelchair and we are getting married in a couple months and we want to go camping for our honeymoon. So I want to be able to carry her. And, uh, and so that's them on their honeymoon um, hiking in Argentina. Um, and so we have that. We also, uh, we've gotten pictures of um, families at national parks and at national parks all over the world, um, families camping, families, uh, doing farming chores and getting to take their children with them. Um, we just have really gotten to see family units kind of staying together um, and being able to all have a, a shared experience, which is um, a really powerful thing. What we've also found is that um, once they have this backpack, um, they get to engage their community more. And so that builds friendships around them. Um, which also lends itself to answering that second question. Um, so yeah, we, we went to Europe in 2016. In 2018, we went to China as our follow-up trip. And uh, that was really amazing in a lot of, a lot of ways. And, um, and so now, since then, um, our, our new kind of adventure is um, just staying in touch with these families and um, also going to visit as many of them as we can. Uh, we've done that around the U.S. Uh, so far, but we, we want to spread out and do that uh, in other countries as well. Um, so yeah, that's the adventure that we're doing right now. Um, I, I wrote a book about uh, the Europe trip and the China trip all together in one book. It's also called We Carry Kevin, and you can get it anywhere books are sold. Um, we have a YouTube channel and social media. You can see more of my story as well as uh, the stories of all these families that have the backpack. And, um, and one, of, one of my favorite things that we're doing right now is when we go to an area where there are several families with backpacks, we, uh, we do a group hike. And so we've done one, you can see in the top right corner, we did one in Colorado. In the bottom left, we did one in uh, Dallas, Texas. And um, it's just been really cool to see uh, 
families with the backpack come out along with other people from your community and we get to see friendships develop uh, there and then at the, at the events. Um, and so, yeah, that, that's what we've been up to. Um, uh, as far as, you know, if, uh, if you're interested in getting involved, um, the website is there, wecarrykevin.org. And um, there, there's a few different things. Um, first off, if you are interested in a backpack for yourself or for someone else, uh, there's two different ways to uh, go about getting that. Um, one is just simply you can purchase it, um, but also um, we started a, a new project, a new program a few months ago where we developed our own crowdfunding platform on our website. So if you uh, are interested in a backpack or know someone that, that, that is, um, but you can't afford it, um, then we can set up a profile for you on our crowdfunding platform and uh, give you the tools to share this need with your community, with your circles on social media, and we share it on ours as well. And uh, that does a lot of different things. Um, one is uh, it um, gives you a voice to uh, ask for help with something that is kind of fun. Um, you're getting to ask for, for help to get a backpack to go on an adventure. And so um, it, it does that and it uh, kind of gets you in front of your community with that need. Um, it also hopefully raises the funds uh, faster for you to be able to get your backpack sooner. Um, and then also <laughs> whoever supports that um, crowdfunding project uh, once it's filled and you get your backpack, and if you want to share photos or videos or stories, uh, anyone that supported it can get that update. And so um, we are uh, hoping to, to build a community around you. Um, so um, yeah, check that out on We Carry Kevin. And then we have some other uh, ways to be involved um, with joining our, uh, becoming a member of the pack. Um, where you can be more involved in what we do. And um, yeah, as I said earlier, we have uh, social media and you can see more of our, our videos and stories and photos and uh, all that good stuff. So uh, I think that's it. Oh, uh, some, um, in the, the questionnaire, there were questions about um, my travels, what, what has been the hardest place to go, the least accessible, what's been my favorite place to go. Um, every place that I've gone has been uh, special in a different way. <clears throat> my, my family comes from England and Ireland, so those places uh, had a lot of significance to me uh, in that regard and were really, really precious. Uh, when we went to China, I uh, met a young lady that was working there at the time um, from Illinois, and we, we met in China for the first time. Uh, and that was in 2018, and uh, now we've been married for two and a half years, and she is uh, the, the most amazing individual in the entire world, and I get to spend every day with her. So China obviously has a special place in my heart uh, as well. Um, so yeah, every, every place that I've gone because of the people and the experiences has, has been uh, unique and special and full of uh, wonder. As far as the most difficult place, uh, the greatest challenge, um, I would have to probably say um, maybe the Great Wall of China. Um, it was designed for if the enemy got on top uh, of the wall, they would have trouble um, trekking across it, and uh, that still remains uh, the case that uh, we, we did, I don't know, a few miles on the top of the Great Wall, and uh, it, was, it was pretty brutal. So um, the steps are all uneven, and some of it is not uh, un unrestored, and um, so it was quite the adventure, but it was, it was awesome. So that's all I've got. Thank you, Kevin. 
All right, I know we're getting close on time, so we'll get to the Q&A very soon. But um, before that, the Nelsons will give their insights um, and thoughts on their accessible travel experiences and their RV life. All right, hi everybody, we're the Nelson family. I'm Kate. I'm Ryan Nelson. Mary and Jackson. And we're currently on the road. We are um, making our way from Texas all the way to Alaska. And right now we're in Port Angeles, Washington. And Ian, um, I just wanna let you know that after this, we're actually gonna go hike part of the Olympic Discovery Trail since we're so close to it. Um, we started traveling in 2018, but not in an RV, just in our van. Kids are gonna go inside their little board, not board, <laughs> but they're sick of, they don't wanna hear us. Um, in our van, and then three years ago, we decided to try traveling in an RV because we were sick of packing and unpacking everywhere that we went. And um, we've just been doing that for the past three years and we've done some pretty epic trips. Um, and so we're excited to share what we've learned with you guys. So, uh, hey, I'm Ryan. Uh, this is a, a photo of our RV and our tow vehicle. Um, on, on the right there, it's a, a 2001 Winnebago Journey with a Braun commercial wheelchair lift. Um, since we are on the road, we've been on the road for a couple of weeks and we're heading to Alaska. Um, it's behind us as well. We, like Kate said, we're in Port uh, Angeles. And then the vehicle we tow behind it is a, a 2016 Braun Ability uh, lowered floor Ford Explorer. Uh, we specifically chose that vehicle because it is able to be flat towed, which is um, pretty important, we feel. We feel um, like my quote there says, be prepared for anything to happen because it probably will. When you're traveling with special needs, um, you, you've got to be, we feel you got to be prepared. We have basically two of every medical equipment. Um, you know, when we're on the road for 30 days, um, we have two of every, everything. And uh, we have, uh, sorry, we have two of everything and we have uh, the ability if something happens with our RV, say, uh, a blown tire or something mechanical, we always pray that doesn't happen. But if it does, we can uh, bug out in our tow vehicle. You see, we have a, a topper on there that we can load equipment and, and supplies in, uh, and then we can all fit in there. And then we also use the tow vehicle uh, or the towed for um, for traveling, uh, uh, for doing excursions away from the RV that maybe places where the RV can't fit. Um, so. We are asked about finding an accessible RV and uh, the one place that I've found is really great, uh, the top website there, rvproperty.com. They list uh, accessible RVs. They have a, several pages dedicated to accessible RVs. You, you'll notice on there that some of them may have already been sold. They keep them uh, listed and just mark them as sold. So it's a great place to like see what's out there, see the range of travel trailers, modified vans, modified, you know, class A RVs, class C RVs. Um, and then the other great uh, place, I use, use Craigslist and Facebook Marketplace to just search. You can search for a wheelchair, um, motorhome, wheelchair RV, and you'll be surprised what comes up. In fact, that's how we found uh, our beauty, which is behind us. Um, and then once you do find it, I highly recommend getting it professionally inspected the uh, NRVIA National RV Inspectors Association has inspectors uh, nationwide you can go on their website and put in your zip code or or the zip code of the RV and uh, hire an inspector to do a professional inspection find anything that could be wrong they give you um, you know a 20 to 30 page report on the RV with pictures and videos of all the issues and it helps you in the negotiation. In fact, we were looking for another RV in Florida and we paid for a professional inspector to, to come inspect it. Well, we weren't even there. And based on his uh, report, we decided not to buy it just because of the condition that wasn't really shown um, in the pictures. And, the, and we actually did video um, tour with the folks who owned it. Um, and then further modify the vehicle. We recommend whatever your needs are. We have a lot of equipment. So this vehicle, um, when we bought it, it didn't really work for us, the layout, um, as well as we had to, uh, we added a Pierstein inverter and some things like that to help with our medical equipment. So um, 
And then the last thing, this is a, an RV, a little project that we purchased last summer and I modified it myself. Um, so we, we were having trouble. We wanted to buy a smaller RV to, to use for weekend trips or to, to rent out to other families with wheelchairs. Um, and we couldn't find a small class uh, C RV. We wanted one on a Sprinter chassis since we have a, another Sprinter. Um, so we bought this one and I, I ordered a, a door and a ramp and we modified it. We cut the door. We did this all in our driveway and basically one weekend we put in the tie downs, uh, cut the door and made it accessible. Um, this is some examples of our, the RV behind us. Uh, on the left is when we first bought it. Uh, it was rather dated from 2001. So dark wood, uh, and on the, on the right is, well, after we did some updating, Kate painted it, Mary and Jackson, our kids, uh, installed the shiplap. And then the, the bench I'm leaning on, we'll have a picture later, but it, it is basically a table that turns into a bed for Mary and stores all of her medical equipment below it. Um, and, go ahead. Well, before that we had a dinette in there and it just wasn't conducive for us because the bed was too low. It was hurting our backs to pick her up. and we also didn't have a lot of places to store her equipment, like a cop assist, a ventilator, um, a vest, you know, depending on what your medical equipment needs are. We just really needed to make sure that we could store everything safely and in a manner that it wasn't going to go flying as it, we were going down the road. Um, and so here's, here's a picture of that. Uh, I, I built that in there. We ripped out the dinette, built that table, and you can see the hinge, the piano hinge where it folds out. And we put a mattress on top of there. So Mary is higher, like she said. And then down below is all of her medical equipment stored. There's a strap that goes across there to hold everything in. And then there's uh, cabinets below that to hold other um, supplies and equipment, as well as cabinets above. And then we it doubles during the day as our... Um, where we eat so that you see the stools there that can easily be stored and i think i mean i didn't do any i just painted it but i think a lot of people may be intimidated when it comes to remodeling an rv um but i think from what you found it's kind of just like if you're remodeling a room in your house mm -hmm. so yes it's a vehicle yes it's going down the road but it was i again i didn't do it but it was easier than i thought it was going to be um you know, it was just like, like I said, if we were to, you know, remodel a bathroom or remodel a room or something. Right. Um, as far as funding sources, uh, it's, I like to think of it similar to a vehicle, although, you know, a lot of times um, some of the insurances will only do a primary vehicle. That may be your case if you're looking to do um, like a van, uh, um, you know, a, a travel van, you could have that be your primary vehicle and have the lift installed. And then you do the rest of the custom modifications in, inside. It's, it's kind of a popular thing. You see a lot of those travel bands when, when you're out west like this. Um, again, local, local grants are a way to do it. Um, the thing that I've found now in, in owning five different um, accessible vehicles, many states and living in many states, they don't charge taxes on a modified vehicle or on a vehicle that you're, you're planning to modify. And so my specific example, we bought the RV um i uh i said hey i'm going to install this lift i filled out the forms had the doctor sign it and submitted it and i didn't have to pay sales tax so that can save you a couple thousand dollars um off the top yeah. and then the the other thing is um don't rule out used equipment or self-installation we've kind of highlighted that um i've purchased uh you know used commercial lifts like the one you saw behind us when the kids were loading up you, they come out of school buses. People will buy a school bus with a lift, and they want to turn it into an RV. They don't may not need the lift, and so they'll list it on Craigslist or on Facebook Marketplace. I bought one two years ago for eighty dollars, uh, and it functions just fine. Uh, just to have a backup, like I said, we have a backup of everything. We don't carry it with us. Um, and then used uh, used vehicles. Like I said, we've we've uh, bought well care for. You know, when we first thought about RVing. Um, we we thought it was out of reach because we're like we can't afford a two hundred thousand three hundred thousand dollar RV that you see advertised brand new, but we we found this one it was significantly less than that, and we've gone over thirty thousand miles in it in the past three or four years, visited numerous state parks, and uh, it's been affordable. So, 
I don't know why our camera is like it is. So I apologize. I don't really have silver here. <laughs> um, so one of the things that in the questionnaire uh, was asked is, what is it like going down the road? And it's an adventure always. Um, daily life in an RV is can be really fun and it can also be really challenging. Um, when we have our dogs traveling with us, making sure that it's clean. <laughs> I mean, making sure clean anyways, but the dog hair is challenging. But um, it, it's really it's really fun. I mean, you have to adapt sometimes um, depending on what's going on, especially if you break down or if the weather is bad. Um, but it's uh, it's been a really good experience for us. So one of the things that we really enjoy doing is traveling to national parks, um, which, you know, there's a lot of good information on this out there. And um, there we go. So a main important thing to do is to get the access pass. And this can either be done by mailing it in or online. You, ha you have to have a letter from your doctor um, in order to receive that stating what your disability is. But once you have the access pass, you can get into any national park for free. Um, the access pass is also free as well. And uh, even like BLM lands, any federal um, you know, parks or lands that, that you have. Um, also, a lot of national parks have accessibility guides and you can find that on their website. You can download those, but you can also get them at the visitor center or at the entrance stations. And that's been a real big help to us. There's a lot of research that you can do online with their websites um, and kind of plan your trip accordingly. Um, but that's been a big help also just to access those while we're there and talk to the park rangers and say, what do you recommend that we do? You know, and especially if you're at a really big park like Yellowstone, um, it's good to have a plan for your day because it is huge. Another, another guide that we use is um, there is a series of books called Barrier Free Travel that Candy Harrington writes. And um, it just talks all about like the different parks. It'll also give you accommodations if you're not camping of which cabins and which lodging and even which rooms are accessible. Heights of the beds, you know, all the things that has been mentioned before. So I thought I would show you if we can get it to um, some of our pictures from our travels. Uh, National parks, like I said, have great accessibility. Grand Tetons has a boat that a wheelchair user can get on and go across Jenny Lake. That was one of the highlights of us last year, um, as well as a lot of paved trails. Sometimes it can be a little bumpy. Um, sometimes it can be a little steep. So it depends on if you're using a manual chair or a power chair like Mary does. Yellowstone is probably the most accessible park we've ever been to. There's boardwalks everywhere. They have a great accessibility guide. Everyone is so extremely helpful. Sometimes the parking can get filled up. Um, so it's best to plan your day early if you can. Sometimes that's not possible. But um, highly recommend Yellowstone if you're looking for a great national park and with all different kinds of landscapes. We just recently went to Muir Woods, which is also a great accessible park. Um, you know, we try and look for places that have smooth paved paths. That's not always accessible or that's not always what we find. So sometimes the hard dirt packed um, paths are great or, or even packed gravel. Um, Yosemite is another one that we found very accessible. Um, we went up to the Lower Falls, which I was very excited that we could get the kids to, Lower Yosemite Falls. And they do have a great accessible guide as well. But again, start your day early because there is a bazillion people that want to visit there. And say Mary did uh, one of her 10-mile hikes for her hiking merit badge. Yeah, for Scouts. In Yosemite um, while we were there and, and was all on a, a, one of their paved paths. So it was pretty awesome. Um, but also there are other places, not just national parks. Um, this is a state park in Oregon that we went to that had uh, boardwalks out to the beach. Um, as you can see, paved paths to lighthouses. I mean, it's just a beautiful place to go. And I'm very surprised out here how many accessible areas there are on the West Coast. We've been driving up and down uh, Highway 101. I guess up 101. Um, so about accessible campsites, um, usually state parks and national parks do have ADA designated sites. Some of them are better than others. Um, we also recommend looking at KOAs because they have patio sites. We find that it's, a, it's good to have a nice paved surface as everybody will probably agree with, um, but plan ahead and reserve those early and just call where you wanna go camping and say, this is my situation, how can you help? And they're usually very, very nice. 
tips and tricks, like I said, plan ahead. We always create a packing list um, so we don't forget any equipment or medical supplies. That's crucial. Um, we also have a booklet of it, just in case we have an emergency, we have a little booklet that we made up. It has different equipment in there, protocols for if somebody's sick, just in case we have to um, you know, go to the hospital, which we hope we don't. And uh, Amazon drop boxes, we've forgotten things before that we can buy off of Amazon. And so we've just had it sent to a drop box, which is great. Another trip, uh, tick, yeah, trick is my crock pot kitchen sink dinners. Well, during long travel days, I'll just put that in the sink. And when we get there, dinner's done. A couple other things that we use, um, you guys have probably found them to be helpful, but uh, small lithium batteries, we have a whole bunch of them that we carry on board. Um, we uh, were able to power everything using the RV and the generator, but sometimes like on this trip, we're going to go to some, some national parks that um, are less, um, they have less facilities than this. So they don't have a power. So we can run our generator for a few hours a day, but then overnight to run ventilators and, and charge wheelchairs and stuff like that. We, we carry uh, some of those larger batteries, lithium batteries to charge everything um, and not wear down the batteries. Um, quite so much in our RV. So we found those to be quite helpful and they're and they're becoming more affordable. Um, I think that's really it. I mean, we've had a really good time. I will say when we started doing this, I was very hesitant and very intimidated. But once we did like our first shakedown run, we went to a local campsite. Um, I realized, you know what, we could probably do this. So it's an adventure for sure. We've had some hiccups along the way, but it's really fun. And if you guys want to follow us on Facebook, we would love that. Um, and we'd also love any suggestions that you guys have as well. And, and the last thing that I'll highlight is, you know, um, one, it's made, it's really changed the way we travel. We, when we used to travel, we would unpack and pack every night into a hotel room. And it was just hauling a lot of equipment um, and tough on, on the caregivers as well as, um, you know, our children. So this, with this, we're able to bring everything with us. We bring a spare of everything. Um, it's nice to have, you know, this much room. Uh, and then the other, the other thing that I'd highlight is that it, it is actually pretty affordable. You can find affordable campsites. Um, state parks and national parks are, are very affordable. Um, and then you, you don't have to be um, overwhelmed by the cost of a brand new RV. You can find, you know, with this, the websites that I shared, um, you can find used RVs that are well cared for and affordable. I think that's it. Thank you. Thank y'all. All right, now we're going to kick it over to our Q&A. Um, we know we're a little bit behind on time here. So um, we do have a few questions that came in. Um, if you have any more, feel free to put them in the portal or in the chat and we will get to those. Um, if our speakers want to come in off um, on video here and unmute. Our first question we're going to direct is for Michelle. Um, I don't know if you saw that in the chat there, but if you could address um, some things in regards to like uh, oxygen on planes and if uh, US versus international flights um, are different in, as far as regulations. Um, so I'll let you take that question. Yeah, I, th I think I understand the question. You know, the, the laws in the United States are very different than what is for international carriers. However, if they are an international carrier flying into the United States, they have to follow U.S. guidelines. So if you were, say, flying, a, you know, a, a, an international carrier and they damage your wheelchair, they have to follow U.S. laws and help refund uh, the repair of your wheelchair. However, if you are flying say, um, out of the country and you are not on a um, U.S. airline that it you are under um, forgetting the name of the law at the moment, but um, it's it's other it's international um, laws. And so um, it, your wheelchair damage, I think, is only covered up to two thousand dollars. So also keep that in mind if you're flying, a, say, a U.S. airline and you fly it over to one country and then you have an, um, a transfer to another country on an international airline, again, your that flight is not covered by U.S. laws. Um, and then I think you had another question about equipment. Um, yeah, I believe um, some, a couple people were wondering about um, oxygen as well as 
ventilators and trachs. Um, how do you go about uh, getting that type of breathing and medical equipment um, and suggestions or advice with that on the flight? Yeah, so you can bring your oxygen. I think there's a special, you just have to get it approved by the FAA or there's a special machine for that, I believe. Um, but there isn't any issues with traveling, I believe, as you know, someone who, who uses a ventilator or um, in regards to the FAA allowing you, you should not have any issues with that. But, um, all right, so thank you for joining us today. And thank you to our speakers for staying on after. Um, really appreciate it. Um, join us for our next uh, adaptive series. It's for adaptive fashion on August 26th. And the link to sign up is in the chat there. Um, so feel free to email us if you have any questions. And as we had mentioned, we are going sailing this summer. So um, Patrick with the Impossible Dream, he spoke a little bit about it, but feel free to join us and sign up and register at the link with qcmd.org slash sail on June 24th. And we hope to see you out on the water there with us. And yeah, we definitely want to keep the conversation going. So feel free to, uh, on our networks, to post about what you've learned and share something um, about travel or share with us your photos of what you experienced on our Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter um, at Here CMD. And um, yeah, thank you. We hope to see you next time.